Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and we are heading into part three of the second Battle of Bull Run. If you'd like to vote for the next animation, cruise on over to the Patreon page. The link is in the description below, and you can cast your ballot. For most of August 29th, Stonewall Jackson had left much of the fight into his division and brigade commanders. His main concern that morning was linking up with Longstreet's wing of the Army of Northern Virginia. That morning, James Longstreet and his corps, along with the commander of the Army, Robert E. Lee, passed through Thoroughfare Gap and marched toward Jackson's position north of Groveton. Stonewall anxiously awaited the other half of the army because he knew that Pope's full strength would soon be upon him. Shortly after 8 a.m. that morning, a young lieutenant of Evander Law's staff named John Cousins galloped up to Jackson's headquarters. He found Jackson to be agitated. Longstreet's through the gap, and I reckon at Haymarket by this time, Cousins announced. Who heads the column? Jackson snapped. Hood's division, General. Those gallant fellows who led your battle at Gaines Farm and who... Jackson cut off the young man and asked, What brigade, sir? Texas Brigade, Cousins answered, finally getting the drift of Jackson's simple wants. Jackson wheeled to one of his staff officers. Major, he yelled, pointing toward the Warrington Turnpike. Put the Texas Brigade here. It's left on the pike. Gallop, sir. Jackson would soon direct Jeb Stewart to guide Longstreet's men to the battlefield. It was 10 a.m., shortly before Short's division made their attack against A.P. Hill's division, when Lee came galloping up the Warrington Turnpike to place the column of Texans and to get a good look at the ground himself, leaving his staff behind. A few minutes later, Lee returned and said, A Yankee sharpshooter came near killing me just now. His staff looked and his cheek had been grazed by the bullet of the sharpshooter. Although Longstreet was now on the field, it would take time for his men to deploy into battle. The Texas Brigade arrived and sent out skirmishers. They made contact with the skirmishers of John Reynolds' division. The unexpected approach of a large Confederate force made the Union commander fall back. Jeb Stewart's job of guiding Longstreet to the battlefield was complete. He dashed off south along the road to Manassas Junction to secure the right flank of the army. About a mile down the road, he topped a hill and could see a dust cloud peek over the trees, indicating a large federal force. He immediately realized the danger such a force could do to Longstreet's flank and sent out skirmishers to engage with the column of Federals. Just like he intended, the resistance stopped the federal force. Stewart sent word to Longstreet to deploy infantry down the road to help bluff the Union troops. Jeb instructed his men to cut tree branches and drag them behind the horses kicking up dust in the process to give the illusion of a large force approaching until the infantry could get there. The blue column stopped by Stuart was the corps of General Fitz John Porter. That morning, Porter and Irvin McDowell had been given a joint order from their commander, John Pope. That order would become famous, as one historian put it, as a masterpiece of contradiction. The joint order simultaneously ordered Porter and McDowell to move forward, halt, and then prepare to fall back. Both Union Corps were to move to Gainesville, miles to the west of Jackson's line. Keep in mind, Pope thought Jackson was fighting out of necessity, not because he wanted to. And Pope also dismissed reports of Longstreet making his way through Thoroughfare Gap. The order also said it may be necessary to fall back behind Bull Run to Centerville tonight. I presume it will be. If any considerable advantage are to be gained by departing from this order, it will not strictly be carried out. With such a vague contradictory order, Porter and McDowell were unsurprisingly confused. However, they moved toward Gainesville. When Porter encountered Stuart, Porter and McDowell came together to discuss what to do next. McDowell thought he could be of little help to Porter, and since the order said if any considerable advantages are to be gained by departing from this order, it will not be strictly carried out, he concluded to move his corps north toward the fighting and Pope. Along the Sudley Road, one of the biggest blunders of the battle was the report sent to McDowell from John Buford, who had been keeping an eye on Longstreet. He reported that Longstreet's corps was approaching the battlefield. McDowell put the report in his pocket. He wouldn't alert Pope to the information until 7 p.m. that night. Porter stayed put, deciding not to press on since he did not know the force in front of him. While the Union commanders struggled to understand their orders, Longstreet ordered Corse's brigade south to relieve Stuart's men. D.R. Jones' division would deploy to Corse's left, along with Kemper's division, which would link with Hood's division. However, besides skirmishing, Longstreet would not press the attack. Lee hoped to make a quick and surprising assault against Pope's army, but Longstreet balked at the thought 
He argued that he didn't know the ground in front of him, and asked for time to reconnoiter it. Lee assented and reports came back that the ground was not favorable for an attack. As Lee was about to order his own engineers to scout the position, Stewart sent in a report alerting Lee that the force on the road south was very large, and this settled the matter for the moment. Pope, thinking he only faced Jackson, and that he had two corps, one under McDowell and one under Porter, approaching the rebel commander's flank, made a fatal error. He presumed. Presumed that Porter and McDowell, upon reaching Gainesville, would attack Jackson in the flank. Therefore, he did not want to launch an assault on Jackson with the portion of the army he had at Groveton. He just wanted to keep Stonewall busy until Porter and McDowell could hit him in the flank. The reality was the two Union Corps never made it to Gainesville, and Longstreet, who Pope had presumed could not arrive until late the next day, was already on the field. The combination of Longstreet arguing not to attack and Pope's misguided beliefs created a lull on the battlefield about midday. The Union commander decided to scout the advanced position of his army in person. He decided that he needed to keep Stonewall busy and distracted until Porter and McDowell could attack. He replaced Short's division with the brigades of Farnsworth and Carr. The relieved Union division took a much needed rest as they had been fighting for six hours and were down to their last cartridges. Pope also ordered General Joseph Hooker to send part of his division to attack Jackson Center, where Milroy's brigade had assaulted earlier that morning. Flabbergasted, Hooker argued that without more support, it would be a disastrous endeavor. Pope agreed and sent word to General Kearney to send one of his brigades to attack Jackson's extreme left flank. With the plan outlined, Brigadier General Grover's New England Brigade of Hooker's division marched for the Confederate center. Kearney sent Brigadier General John C. Robinson to support Grover's attack on the Confederate left. Robinson moved with incredible slowness, feeling his way through the terrain. Grover, on the other hand, moved his men close to the railroad cut, but thought ordering his troops into such an obstacle too foolish, and instead took his brigade on a 500-yard march east behind Carr's men and in front of Farnsworth to where Thomas's brigade of Georgians were. When Thomas saw Short's division leave about an hour before, he had moved his men up closer to the cut, exposing a large gap between his own brigade and that of Maxie Gregg. Grover's men formed in two battle lines, and moved up to close range with the men from Georgia. The Confederate rifles flung lead at the New Englanders, but it did not faze them. As the rebels laid behind the cut reloading, Grover gave the order to charge, catching the Georgians off guard and capturing many and sending the rest into flight. The Confederate line was dissolving. One rebel soldier tripped on a tree root. As he attempted to escape, a sergeant from New Hampshire reached down and grabbed the bowie knife in the prone man's belt and raised it over his head. The rebel yelled out, oh for God's sake, don't. The Union soldier caught off guard at their request said, all right, Johnny, and put the knife in his own belt and kept charging. The New Englanders surged through the hole in A.P. Hill's line. Gregg's battered brigade attempted to make a stand, but the first Massachusetts fired volley after volley into the South Carolinians. Grover rode up and down his lines, urging his men on and hoping with all his heart that the support from Kearney would arrive. His New Englanders doggedly held on to their position driving the gray-clad troops. However, without help from Kearney, the situation was becoming dire. Pender's brigade, held in reserve, was deploying against him. Grover rode back toward the cut, urging the wounded who could to come to the front. His horse would become horribly wounded, and he himself would barely dismount the animal before it ran into Confederate lines. With no sign of help and his men taking horrible casualties, Grover regrettably ordered his men to fall back. Robinson's advance had been stopped by the Confederates on the left, so the effort made yielded nothing. Pope then sent orders to John Reynolds to move his division against Jackson's right, but this confused Reynolds because he had been driven back by a rebel force from the west. That force would be in his flank if he attacked where Pope intended. Reynolds made an attempt to attack Longstreet's men, but realized he was too outnumbered and fell back, sending word back to Pope that a considerable enemy force was confronting him. Pope scoffed at the report and assured Reynolds that the men he saw were Porter's men preparing to destroy Jackson's flank. At the Union Center, the Confederate sharpshooters had been harassing Federal artillery. Pope wanted those men dealt with and sent Colonel Nagel's brigade to drive in the rebels and assault their works. Nagel's men made initial progress but got brought to a halt. Seeing their comrades being pushed back, Johnson and Stafford's brigades swung their battle line to encompass Nagel's flank. 
sending the Federals into a retreat. Right behind Nagel was the brigade under Colonel Taylor. As the Union troops advanced, they met with the same fate as their predecessors and had to withdraw under the intense pressure of the Confederate flanking maneuver. Stafford's men from Louisiana captured some artillery pieces, but with no horses available to pull it back to their lines, they hitched about 50 captured Union soldiers to the pieces and pulled them to safety, which brought a laugh from the Confederate audience. After the brief but bloody attacks of Nagel and Taylor around 4 p.m., both sides adjusted their battle lines, Pope with the intention of attacking Jackson's left flank again since most of the progress had been made in that direction. He called on Philip Kearney to organize his division for a major assault. Meanwhile on the Confederate side, A.P. Hill's brigades had been battered worse than any others on the rebel side, especially Gregg's South Carolinians. Hill asked Gregg whether he could hold the position. Gregg stated, I will hold the position with the bayonet. But Hill knew the situation. Hill sent a courier with a message to Jackson describing Gregg's situation. Jackson listened to the courier and followed him back to Hill, where Stonewall declared, General, your men have done nobly, but if you are attacked again, you will beat the enemy back. As Hill rode off to his lines, Jackson yelled, I'll expect you to beat them. Shortly after 5 p.m., the brigades of Robinson and Burney had deployed in a strong line opposite the rebels. With one order, charge, the blue troops rushed against the brigades of Archer, Thomas, and Gregg. It devolved into a bitter back and forth. General Gregg unsheathed his grandfather's sword, which had been used in the American Revolution, and began stalking the battle line, encouraging his men by saying, let us die here, my men, let us die here. General Branch and his brigade, which was guarding the extreme left flank, seeing the perilous situation Gregg was in, ordered forward the 37th North Carolina to aid the South Carolinians. Although the Union forces had made significant progress, they needed additional support. Kearney, riding within the battle lines, narrowly missing bullets as they whizzed by him, saw Union troops moving to his left. It was the small brigade of Colonel Daniel Leisure of Isaac Stevens' division. Stevens rode up to Kearney. Before Stevens could speak, Kearney asked, Where are your troops? Stevens pointed to the 100th Pennsylvania surging forward. Kearney asked, Will these men fight? Stevens replied, By God, General Kearney, these men are my roundheads, referring to their ancestry from the roundheads that fought against the King of England during the English Civil War. Kearney then proceeded to Colonel Leisure, waving his only arm in the direction of the unfinished railroad and saying, that is your line of advance and sweep everything before you. Look out for your left, I'll take care of your right. He added before leaving, 60 pieces of artillery are on the heights behind you and as soon as you start, they will open over your heads so as to prevent any reinforcements being sent against you till you can clear the whole thing out. Leisure's men bounded into the woods and captured the cut from Archer's brigade, but moved no further. Branch moved the rest of his brigade to stop Kearney, but the one-armed Union general was on the verge of breaking Stonewall's defenses. The attack had lasted 45 minutes, when a loud rebel yell could be heard behind Gregg's men. And a few moments later, 2,500 men from Jubal Early's brigade descended upon the blue soldiers. The weight was too much to bear, and Kearney's men were pushed back. Jackson had narrowly avoided disaster on multiple occasions, but had held on. For the most part, his men could rest because it was getting dark, but that was not the case for Longstreet's wing, which began to stir as darkness began to take over the field. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. The fourth and final part will be coming out next week, so stay tuned.